I'm Mike Hogan, one of our Ohio State um, SARE coordinators. So the topic for this session is sustainable sweet corn production, and our speaker is a, a SARE Farmer and Rancher grant recipient uh, from a few years ago, and it's she's going to be talking about sustainable sweet corn production. And uh, Marissa uh, Kraftock from uh, Warren County in southwestern Ohio is the speaker. Marissa. All right, welcome, and like you said, I'll be talking about my research in sustainable sweet corn production. Can you all hear me okay at this volume? So this is my project number. In case you all have any questions about it afterwards, you can look it up on the SARE website. Um, so it's just a reference thing. So first, I'll talk about my personal background. I'm a student at the University of Kentucky. I graduated in May 2013 with a Bachelor's of Science in Sustainable Agriculture. Um, then I started last fall to work on getting my Master's of Science in Nutritional Sciences. Um, I am the co-owner, along with my younger brother, um, of the Community Family Farm CSA. It's a vegetable CSA, and we focus on mostly supporting our customers through fresh local produce, um, and we also provide farm partnerships with people who raise eggs and um, beef and pork and also, uh, also honey. And my mom and I make jams and jellies from local fruit and all of those things are extra for sale. We started doing that a couple of years ago because people said they wanted to have like a one-stop shop sort of deal instead of just getting the vegetables from us. So I'll talk a little bit about applying for a SARE grant. Um, these are things that I thought would be useful and helpful for people who are thinking about maybe applying for a SARE grant. First, you have to think of your idea. Once you think of your idea, um, make sure that that idea is meaningful to you, it's interesting to you, as well as to your community. Because part of SARE grants is an outreach component. So if it is interesting to you and meaningful to you, also make sure it's meaningful to the community so that outreach is a good part of the project. Um, then you need to research the idea on the SARE database to make sure it hasn't already been done, especially in your region. If it's been done maybe in New England or Florida, then it's a little bit different because the climate is so much different here. But try to make sure it's unique, make sure what you're, what you're going to be doing is using the money in a resourceful way. Um, also, I would suggest seeking help from someone who's already written a grant. Try to find someone from a university. And the, if you have a College of Ag nearby or an extension agent, maybe they've written a grant. I worked with um, one of my professors, Dr. Krista Jacobson. She writes a lot of grants, and I just felt that it was really helpful to go in with my idea and with the proposal. And I said, this is what I want to do, but I've never written a grant before, and I was a junior in college. And I just said, what, how do I even start? And she helped me work through the process, and I thought that was especially helpful. Um, coming from someone who's successfully written several grants. Um, I also contacted my regional SARE coordinator, Alan Sundermeyer, and he was very helpful because he made some suggestions to the proposal and said these are things you might want to think about before you submit it to the committee to review it. And um, outreach is key. They really like to see a lot of outreach to show that you're sharing your results from your research with the community, with other farmers, so that this research can be applied to many other applications. My project purpose. The purpose was to see which method of um, sweet corn production would be most sustainable. Um, basically, in my area, the main problem that I saw was that of the white corn that was chosen to grow was mostly silver queen. And silver queen has a lot of issues with the fungal disease smut. And so because of this, people were losing a lot of production and yields to this disease. And I just felt that there had to be another white corn sweet variety that people would enjoy eating as consumers that growers could also feel was a realistic choice. So then I thought to have like a double um, randomized trial where I could do the uh, heirloom varieties versus hybrid varieties, and the hybrid varieties being my control, because that's what most of the people in my area grew. Then I would also have the organic versus the conventional, so that I could see, and again, the conventional being the control, because that's what most people in my area do, and then see if the organic was really a viable option for farmers in terms of money and out output, and, and based on soil results, um, that I've done through soil tests. 
So my hypothesis was that the heirloom corn would be better received by consumers and more resistant to insects. Um, I also thought the conventional corn practices would be um, more practical in terms of time and cost. Farmers oftentimes are pushing their budget limits, they're doing a lot of work themselves so they don't have a lot of time. And so I thought that those would be things that would end up more in favor on the conventional production side. So these are some of the projects, and I tried to put a lot of pictures throughout this so that you can sort of see how things were going. Um, and then if you think of any questions, you're welcome to ask throughout the presentation, or you can save them to the end. It's just your all's preference. So these are some of the major tasks that I had uh, to do during the course of the project. So it starts with ordering the seeds and then identifying which areas on the farm that we wanted to plant. The land that I used was my parents' farm, and I just, where that's where our vegetable CSA is, so I just took part of that. Um, then I had help with, from my dad and my younger brother with preparing the ground. Uh, I planted the corn, and then when, you know, I didn't feel that enough of the population came up for the amount of seed that I planted, then I would replant certain patches um, just by ripping out a patch and then replanting it all together. Uh, then we fertilized, harvested, counted yield data, insect data, disease data, and that was mostly just observational, just like how often did this patch get the disease, did it spread to the other patches. Um, we did put the organic section on a different area than the conventional section uh, in hopes that it wouldn't affect one or the other. These are tools that I used. Um, we I did part of the Sarah Grant budget. I bought a backpack sprayer so that when I was spraying the herbicide on the conventional corn, um, that I wouldn't have to use one of the little hand pump five gallon at a time deal. This is a bigger container. It's easy to carry and it has a mechanized, so you just turn it on and it sprays. Um, the Earthway cedar down on the bottom right corner is how I planted the corn. So it's got like a popper type thing in it and the different wheels for corn. And that's, I use that because that's what a lot of people in our area use. That's what we were using on our farm at the time. So if something was going to work, it needed to work with what we were already using. This fertilizer in the bucket on the bottom left is the, fer the conventional fertilizer, the triple 20 nitrogen synthetic fertilizer. And we just get that from the local ag supply store. For the organic uh, fertilizer, we did use um, chicken manure that wasn't locally sourced, but it was organic. So for planting, you can see here on the bottom left, um, this is my dad and I planting. He was working out a kink with one of the belts, and I was going back through and making sure it was all covered up. We found that when this is done with this planter, that sometimes the seeds aren't always covered up. And then if you don't go back and just like kick a little dirt over them, then the birds come through and pick the seeds out even before they have a chance to sprout. Um, and then the bottom right is when I was staking because we have a problem with uh, crows eating our little sprouts. So when the corn first comes up and it's just, doesn't even have roots in the ground very much, it's just sprouting off the seeds still, crows will come through and pull the corn right out of the ground. But if you take like old pop cans out of your recycling bin, tie them to like, with tomato twine to a wooden stake and stake them in the ground, the noise rattling around generally keeps them all away. Fertilizing, this is an example of a process of fertilizing. First we started to use the fertilizer with like a grass seed spreader, thinking that it would broadcast over it, but then I felt like after doing that for one row that it wasn't really getting on the row and it wasn't the most effective way to use the fertilizer. So then um, we just took it in the hand and just like tossed it down the row like you would um, a synthetic fertilizer. The budget components, I had some outside labor um, and then I traveled to the OFA conference last year and was an exhibitor in the exhibit hall and had some posters and um, so I needed some supplies for that to create my posters, print the pictures out and to get the registration for the conference. A really nice thing about the SARE grants is that they really want you to include everything that you can in your budget so that the farmer themselves is not out of pocket for anything. 
So they include you, they encourage you to include things like your gas up here and just making sure that it's the appropriate rate for when you get reimbursement for things. Uh, I also had money for supplies such as seeds and fertilizers, gas, I had electric fencing materials because we have a deer problem and a raccoon problem getting into our corn. We used a solar powered electric box and then strung two rows of um, metal wire around, one about hip height so that the deer would be blocked and one about ankle height so that the raccoons would be blocked. Um, I've also seen people do three rows of it, but I didn't particularly feel this was necessary. So now I'm going to go through the different varieties of the corn that I chose and some pictures of the seed, the plants, and the ears of corn at the end. So this is Stoll's Evergreen. It's an heirloom white variety, and this was grown conventionally. As you can see, um, that's me in the corn patch, and that's a pretty tall variety of sweet corn. Um, in terms of yellow bodacious, which is a hybrid variety that's commonly grown, um, it's usually about as tall as I am. So that was particularly tall. Um, it was fairly easy to plant. The kernels went nicely through the earthway cedar, and then I always have the planting dates here. Golden Bantam is the heirloom yellow corn. So uh, it was very hard to plant because of the way the seeds were shaped, they would constantly get stuck in the planter, and then you have to like pop them out and replant it, and the population wasn't as good because not as many came out when you were walking with the planter. Uh, Blue Jade is the, um, basically I had, I had three hybrid varieties, a white, a yellow, and a bicolor. And so instead of a bicolor heirloom, which I don't really think, as far as I can tell with my research, there aren't bicolor heirlooms. So I chose a colored variety of heirloom corn, and it was Blue Jade. Um, it was very easy to plant. The kernels were very tiny, and as you can see, again, the plant height, I mean, it was up to like mid-thigh on me, so the plant height was very small. Um, we had some damage to it before the raccoon fencing was put up, just because um, it was so low to the ground that the raccoons could just run through and rip it off. So we had some damage to that, and that's the color of the corn up there, so it's a very beautiful color. But you eat like that, like sweet corn too? Yeah, we ate it. Um, I mean, we just like boiled it for five minutes and put some butter and salt on it and ate it. Um, it's not quite as tender as some other varieties of corn. It's, I think personally it would be better if you were grinding it for cornmeal. Um, but it is still, still, still tasty. This is the Silver Queen and it's, um, it's our white hybrid variety. And we planted it a little bit later, and then we also had to replant it, and that was by hand. So we just, I just went through and like replanted it, because I saw when it was little enough that it wasn't going to be enough. So I just went through. I also had some trouble with Earthway Cedar in this one, which is kind of interesting because I had never had problems planting Silver Queen with that planter before. <laughs> this is the Bodacious, which I was talking to you about earlier. It's our yellow hybrid. Um, and so, the with the convention or with the hybrid varieties, I had a lot of difficulties finding organic seed, like organic certified seed. And so, because of that, that's why I have on this one um, the organic planted. So, if it has it on the same slide, that probably means that I didn't wasn't able to find seed. Peaches and cream was the bicolor variety that I chose, and it's a beautiful variety, and a lot of customers really like that variety. We like it, it's easy to grow. Um, we did have some problems with population, and I replanted it later on. The Silver Queen, um, this is a really good example of what the issue is when I was doing proposing for this grant. This is the fungal disease smut. It's an airborne, disease, the spores infect, the, they can infect many parts of the corn. Most commonly they infect the kernel of the corn. So each of these things here is a kernel of corn. And now it's been infected and it's blown up and it's, it's moldy and it's 
To us, in general, it's inedible. Um, however, I have found that it is a delicacy in a lot of Mexican restaurants. Um, and if you were ever able to propagate it and grow it on purpose, you would probably make a fortune. Because um, it's very, very expensive. It's sold by the pound, and it weighs hardly nothing. So, um, and that's an example of how much foliage is on a silver queen plant. That's why that picture is there. Can you have it? Huh? Can you have it? No, it kind of grosses me out. So. <laughs> <laughs> and it's something that I try to prevent, so I, I don't know. I've never had it, but yeah. I'm just curious, when you're planting this and you're doing back how many, how large are your plots as far as acreage? Um, each, so each section, each variety, and each treatment, organic and conventional, got four rows, each 150 feet long. Um, I did four rows because a lot of times the outer two rows have different effects or different populations or different yields than inner rows. So that way I had inner and outer instead of just multiple rows. To plant the silver, silver twin organic or chemical? Or both? both. All the varieties were planted organically and conventionally. Um, this is the Golden Bantam Organic. Um, it had to be replanted. Uh, this one was interesting because remember the conventional golden bantam was hard to plant with the earthway planter. This one wasn't as hard to plant, but um, still difficult. Souls Evergreen Organic. Um, this was personally one of my favorites. Uh, it seemed to grow very nicely and it did well. And, um, with, the, with the chicken manure fertilizer, it just really seemed to, this combination seemed to work really well. Does it still or drink? Do you have as much sugar content in that as you did in the other? I did not evaluate sugar content. Well, um, I, know, I found that that solar does not have as good a sugar, sugar taste as some of the other varieties, and it has shorter shelf life when you, when you go to the farmer's market or something. Yeah. Um, with this, the way I marketed my products is through a community supported agriculture. So, because we have so many uh, customers, we have about 175 customers, and I don't want them all coming in on one day and picking up. So, we pick the day of. So, we have a cold room, like a walk in cooler, where we can store things if things get ready before um, they need to be picked. But in general, if I'm picking corn, I'm picking it the morning of, they come pick it up that afternoon. Um, part of the analysis I did was I had a grower satisfaction from our end and I had a consumer satisfaction and I'll talk about that a little bit later but it's basically like a blind um, survey where I gave some of my customers and said we tried this out, tell me how you liked it and I didn't tell them whether it was heirloom or hybrid or organic or conventional but I marked down which ones they were trying. And, that was kind of interesting. So results, like I said, I measured grower and consumer satisfaction. I measured yield, population planting, ear length, and plant height. So in general, the hybrids were more uniform in stalk size and ear length, and they were more uniform and and maturation. So for instance with the golden bantam um, it was hard to tell when it was ready because the cob itself was so small around that comparatively to any other variety I had ever grown that when I felt it it felt like it wasn't ready but then when I picked one it looked ready and I tasted it and it tasted ready so it was easy to get that to a point where it was almost too ready and then it became a little bit tough. Um, with the Silver Queen that was the exception because it did not mature appropriately and I had to go through and pick that patch several times which is not ideal for farmers because farmers would just like to pick the patch clean, maybe pick it a second time and be done with it. Um, that's how most of the hybrid varieties were. Most of the heirloom varieties you kind of had to like spot pick. Um, comparing the organic and the conventional, honestly, the labor time wasn't that different. I expected it to be tremendously higher on the organic side because there was going to have to be weeding time and 
um, but it, it just wasn't that different. The hours logged in the conventional plots and the hours logged in the organic plots were higher in the organic plots, but not detrimental. So I don't think it's a hindrance to do it organically based on labor time alone. Um, the conventional was less expensive in the seed. Uh, it was easier to find in bulk. A lot of times, like with the blue jade seed, I had to buy it in smaller packages, and when things are bought in smaller packages, they cost more money. So that was kind of a hindrance. Oh, this was the herbicide that I sprayed the conventional with, the Bali ATZ. And I chose that because after consulting with the ag guy who we usually consult with at the supply store, because it has the ATZ, which is the atrazine in it, and it's got um, a broadleaf as well. So it, both this particular product kills broadleaves and grasses. So that's why I chose that one. So now I'm going to go through a couple of graphs. Um, Along the bottom, it has the varieties that I've grown. C means conventional, and O means organic. I'll just pinpoint a few of the results. Uh, the bodacious yellow, which is a yellow hybrid variety, grown conventionally, was personally my favorite to grow. Easiest to pick out the stalk, matured most uniformly. Um, I didn't have any problems with weed pressure, disease pressure, insect pressure, hardly any earworms. I just felt like it was a really easy corn to grow, didn't take that much maintenance. Um, also, the Stoll's Evergreen conventionally was also one of my favorites to grow. Didn't, I mean, that one had probably the least amount of earworms. The reason it wasn't the highest on my list was because it doesn't mature uniformly. And so I had to spot pick it, and I wasn't, I didn't always have enough ready for everyone that day. So I had to mix varieties and let people sort of pick and choose, which is okay, it's just not the way I usually try to run the CSA. The lowest one was a Silver Queen Organic. There was so much smut issues with it. Um, they didn't see, it didn't seem to respond as well to the chicken manure compared to the synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. Um, it just was not, not my favorite to grow. Could you repeat the two top ones again? Yeah, the top ones are Bodacious Conventional and Stoll's Evergreen Conventional. And this is the consumer satisfaction. Um, again, the top two, the top one was the peaches and cream organic. And the second was the bodacious conventional. Um, what was interesting was that the conventional and the organic taste-wise, when people or the tenderness and all these things that they were evaluating, it didn't seem to be that much different. They didn't seem to have a preference one way or the other. Um, especially because they weren't, they didn't know, like is it organic, is it conventional. Not to say they didn't have preferences personally with their morals or their health beliefs about conventional versus organic, but in terms of taste, which is what some people say is their reasoning for buying organic, they couldn't taste the difference. And this is a listing, just from like top to bottom. So at the top is the highest ranked, and the bottom is the lowest ranked. Um, blue jade was the lowest on the consumers. It, they just said it was kind of mealy. It was a little more tough. The ear length isn't near as long as you'll see on a, one of the um, future graphs. Um, it, I mean, they're only like four inches, five inches long on the ear length instead of, you know, an eight or ten inch ear, which is what people like to have because if they're just going to buy a dozen, you know, a dozen is a dozen regardless of how long or how thick the kernels are. Um, and the growers, the Silver Queens, were my least favorite to grow just because of how many I had to throw out because of smut. I mean, smut, like I said, can be profitable in a situation, but for the vegetable CSA, they don't want it. I can't use it. Um, followed by the Golden Bantam because it was hard to plant. It matured. Oddly, it was hard to tell when it was ready. Marissa, how did you ask the consumers to evaluate? Did you give them a tool? What, what did you I gave them a form, an evaluation form, explaining what my project was, and I sort of, you know, randomly and thought about which customers to ask, because I knew which ones would be like, no, I don't want to do this, and I knew which ones would be okay with doing an answer honestly. Um, and so then I would just give them two varieties per week. And so at the, what we have is like a regular share and a robust share, and the robust share gets a dozen ears of corn per week at, when in season, and the regular share gets six ears. 
So then I would just say, I'm going to split your share of corn among two varieties, and then I would tell them this is variety A, this is variety B. If they looked too similar, I would put them in like separate containers marked like A, B. And then in my book, I would mark down which varieties I was giving out that day, and I had them evaluate qualities like tenderness, taste, how easy was it to cook, did your family like it, things like those. These are the yields. Um, so the varieties are on the bottom, and the blue is conventional, the red is organic. So you can see it's not always one or the other. Um, what was interesting though was the heirloom varieties are, these three are the heirloom varieties, and you can see grown in the conventional manner always had significantly higher yields, which I kind of thought would be the reverse, just because heirloom was grown traditionally organic, not conventional. Um, and, and two of the hybrid varieties, the organic was more productive. And again, I thought that was sort of reverse because the hybrid varieties were made to be grown conventionally. But that's not always the best way for the yields, especially the peaches and cream. This is a, a table showing you ear length. So um, the starts, these top three are the hybrids. These bottom three are the heirloom varieties. Obviously, the Stoll's Evergreen and the Peaches and Cream Bodacious, well, all of these are pretty much long. And then the Golden Bantam was short. You can see the Blue Jade um, was very short, comparatively. Stoll's Evergreen was obviously the highest. I mean, 13 and a half inches grown conventionally is, I mean, that's a long ear of corn. That's over a foot long. Um, and those are averages taken from a sampling of different ears. Uh, this is population per planting. So you can see um, it wasn't always one way or the other, but again, I mean, this is such a dramatic difference. The heirloom, the population in the conventional plantings was so much higher than the population in the organic plantings. I mean, just so much higher. And I'm not exactly sure why that is, but I was very surprised by that result, to say the least. So the number of plants? Yes, yeah, so the number of plants. So I just went through and was like one, two, three. And at the end of each row, I marked my book how many, and then I counted for each of the four rows. So I just went through and hand counted them all. This is plant height, um, and now when I just went out there with tape measure, and I just, my brother is 6'4", so I had him boarded at the top, and I measured it down at the bottom, and I said, what does it say? And then he would tell me what it says, and I would record it in my notebook. Um, and again, these are average of set multiple plants, so I went through and then just pick like the tallest or the shortest. Um, but you can see it's, Stoll's Evergreen was obviously the tallest, but you can see that in the picture as well. When I was standing there, it was just it just towered over me. Why did you include plant height as one of your parameters? Um, I thought that it might show a difference in conventional versus organic because I thought maybe one of the fertilizers or the other would allow the plant growth to be taller. I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing because if you're still only getting in production two ears of corn, per planting, then I'm not sure maybe it's a waste of energy to grow that tall of a plant when you're only getting two ears of corn. Because with the blue jade, I mean, you would get a 36 inch plant that's three feet tall, but on that plant, I got like six ears of corn. And so that's probably, just thinking about it logically, a more energy efficient plant than say 117 inches for Stoll's Evergreen, but you only get two ears per plant. Um, I don't know that that's really important for producers because we're not trying to maximize energy use in terms of fertilizer, but if anyone was ever looking at like the biomechanics or biofuel sort of things, I thought that would be interesting. This is part of my outreach pr uh, project. This is me last year at the OFA conference uh, as an exhibitor at the booth. Um, I also had a local newspaper article about the project, 
and I talked to a local farmer to see what his thoughts were about the results and to help me with part of the discussion for the report to talk about why things might have been different or what could have been. And he's a local farmer. He's been doing it for his whole life, and he's probably about 75 years old, so he's still in production, so he must know a thing or two. Um, I was also a keynote speaker at the Warren County Soil and Water Conservation District's annual conference. They had myself and a chief meteorologist in our area come and speak at their conference, so um, that was a really good outreach opportunity. And then I also had a field day where people came to my farm and saw the plots and asked questions about what was going on, why did I do things differently, that sort of thing. Um, this is the benefits and impacts, and this um, square here shows what people were evaluating in the consumer evaluation. Um, part of the benefits um, improved stream quality because we have a uh, water conservation plan with NRCS for the waterways and the no-till type deal. And um, where our conventional plots are, are right next to and a little bit above on terms of height for we're spraying the atrazine. So when it rains too much, I'm sure that those soils are just going right into the water stream. Um, so if that on the organic plot, it was certainly improved compared to the conventional because in previous years, if I hadn't been doing this trial, all of it would have been conventional and um, so it would have been twice as much runoff. Um, manure use increased, herbicide decreased, um, marketing to farm produce increased. People were really interested in the fact that I had heirloom varieties. They like having different varieties. They really enjoy the experience of learning that there are other varieties out there than just, you know, what they see in Kroger, what they see at even Whole Foods, um, things they just can't get. And that goes beyond just sweet corn with eggplants or peppers and tomatoes. And people really enjoy the multiple varieties. In fact, with the eggplant on our farm, I found that the Black Beauty, which is the typical eggplant, is people's least favorite. So what did we learn? Um, consumers can't taste the difference in sweet corn between organic and conventional. Again, like I said, they may have reasons that they choose organic because of health reasons or environmental reasons, but in terms of taste, they cannot taste the difference. Uh, this is a picture of the field day down here. Um, when we're showcasing the sweet corn. What to do differently? So if I could do it again, I would consider personal labor costs. Uh, I considered in the budget outside labor costs because obviously I had to pay someone else to help me with this. I did not consider my own personal time as a cost, and I think that's something if you're all going to apply for a grant that you should definitely consider. I mean, I enjoyed it anyway, but I mean, realistically, if I hadn't been doing the work, I would have had to pay someone else to do it, and that would have been a cost. Um, I would also have more specifically designated tasks. So it was easy for me to say, this needs done, whoever's available can do it. But it would be nice to say, you know, counting the population is my job, and fertilizing is so-and-so's job. And when it needs done, then I can just be aware that that person needs to spend time during their day to do that. Um, I would also do more insect scouting. I didn't really do that in a scientific manner. I did it more of an observational way where I could just say that variety didn't have any and that one had a lot. But a lot, I mean, it's just subjective. So um, I think that's one thing that was part of a weakness in my grant. And then I would also talk to more farmers in the area to show my results and to share them. Yeah. How hours do you doing this? Like, with Oh gosh, um, it had, it probably was close to 200, including like the researching, the planting, the fertilizing, the harvesting, with outreach, with preparation, writing the grant, final report, all those things, probably close to 200. So Sarah Grant will pay for your labor then. Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing farmers that we work with on the grants, they say, okay, then we'll put in you know, $8 an hour. And we're like, no, <laughs> we shouldn't put McDonald's wages in there. Right. Um, I mean, try so to That's find something it. to keep in mind. Even if it's time intensive, mm -hmm. it will pay you for your labor, which is a little different with some farmers. Yeah, it is different. And again, 
like with the gas mileage, I mean, there's a set rate that you have for gas mileage, and there's a good, and make it comparable to what the pay is in your area. So if for some reason it's way higher in your area than the state or national average, you know, maybe put in your budget explanation, like, this is higher because, and just list your reason. So where do we go from here? Um, this bottom right picture is just an aerial view from the top of our house uh, of the vegetable CSA plots. Um, but we have decided to keep Stoll's Evergreen to replace Silver Queen. Customers like it better, it grows better, there's less disease on it, it matures more uniformly. Um, and then we've also switched to using the chicken manure, at least on our sweet corn production, and occasionally on other vegetables when we have leftover. Um, just because it responds, the plants respond really well, and um, if you can get it from the right source, it can be less expensive, better for the environment. Um, it's just a nice sort of circle of life concept. Um, and then I also have decided to let the customers be a variety or part of a variety experimentation. Again, with the eggplant, with the tomatoes, they can say, I really like this one, or I didn't like this one at all. It's easy to tell at the end of the day which varieties of tomatoes are left over. And if they're consistently left over, people don't like that variety and you change it. And these are some of my acknowledgments. I worked with the Ohio Farm Bureau, the Conservation District, my family all helped. OFA helped with allowing me to be here as a presenter. Um, Clarksville Ag, I had Sarah staff and regional coordinators, and my professor at the University of Kentucky. Um, she was a big help in helping me write the proposal. So if you all have any questions now, I will take those. Do you have any idea how much nitrogen you put down on the crops? Um, no, I don't have a really good record of that. Basically, within the family farm system, we each have our own setup where we have traditional roles and responsibilities. And my dad is responsible for, because he's done this his whole life, I mean, he's just decided, like, this is, and he knows this is how much fertilizer the corn needs. So I just used what we always used, just to one, make it a more of a control standard so I wasn't changing so many different things in production, and two, because it always seems to work before, so I just thought I would try. Is it, is it based on, is, is there so many pounds per row, or I mean, is it something you can calculate out? Yeah, know? I'm sure that it is something like pounds per row. Um, we have got it down sort of to an art where I fill a bucket up, like a five gallon bucket and then I hold the bucket and reach my hand in and I get a handful and I walk about like five feet. Okay. And but so like, how far do you get before you have to fill the bucket back up? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that gets to what yeah. you're looking yeah. for. Big bulk um, I mean I can do like eight rows two hundred feet long each okay. um, with like two and a half gallons of because I have a five gallon bucket and I can't carry it. Like, I just wonder how when you compare your organic to your conventional, I mean the, the, the organic was a five four two or whatever the yeah. conventional was a twelve twelve twelve. It was a triple twenty. Triple twenty. So, so you're putting out totally different rates of nitrogen. Yeah. And I think that was interesting to see in the production results and the yield results and the plant height results because again I kind of expected with a triple twenty nitrogen that you would have significantly higher because you're putting on so much more because I did the same thing. I still just got a handful and walked like five feet okay. with the chicken manure, and it was only five, four, three. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes the plants grew taller, had better yields with the chicken manure. So it makes me think that the triple 20 might be a waste of energy, a waste of nitrogen, that you don't really need that much nitrogen on there. Um, and like I said, we've sort of switched to using chicken manure just because the plants respond just as well, if not better. They certainly are a much darker green color which indicates in general plant health. And you only fertilize them at one time? Mm -hmm. At the beginning, when they were about varying from like this tall to this tall is when I would fertilize them. I didn't want to fertilize them when they were too much taller than that because they would get too much foliage. The fertilizer would stick down in there and it would burn it up. Right. Well, if you all don't have any more questions, I actually, yeah. Um, I am curious. I'm a foreign language person, so like working with the Hispanic community would be really neat with the smut. But I'm curious if you did, did you have crossover between 
the, the Silver Queen, Smut, and your other varieties? Did they draw in that fungus? Um, you know, there was a little bit of crossover with the fungal smut, um, especially the Golden Phantom seemed to have a little bit of problems with it, with it which is the yellow heirloom variety. Um, but I saw no smut in the Bodacious, um, the Blue Jade, the Stoles Evergreen. Um, maybe a couple of it, kernels got infected with the peaches and cream, but not enough that I would be concerned about. Yeah, mostly just Silver Queen, so if you're ever trying to propagate it, Silver Queen would be best. Yeah. Do you plant all at the same time, or do you split your plantings every 10 days, two weeks? Um, some of them we split um, by about a week, just for many reasons, but the main reason was because we were doing this project in conjunction with the Vegetable CSA. Um, if I planted all of these at the same time, I would have had a lot of corn ready all at one time. Although some of the maturation dates were longer. So the Stoll's Evergreen had a longer maturation date as well as the Silver Queen. So then I was able to plant them at the same time as like Bodacious, which has a very short maturation time. And I would still get them ready at different times. When I replanted them, uh, they, those were obviously planted at different times because I waited to see if they were going to do something as a patch of corn. And when they didn't, then I ripped it out and replanted it. So they were around the time of like mid to late May through mid to late June was when things were being planted. The late, the mid June is when they were being replanted. And those varieties were not ready until about Labor Day, which is something to consider when you're thinking about um, corn earworms or army worms because the later in the season you get, the more earworms you have. But we um, don't seem to have, that was one of the reasons, um, one of the suggestions that the regional SARE coordinator, Alan Sundermeyer, gave to me was to not apply any insecticides of any kind on the conventional plot because he thought that that would mess up the insect population on the conventional side of it. Um, however, on our farm, we really don't have a problem with insects. I was just going to spray the insecticide on the conventional corn for the fact that a lot of people in our area do. We've never sprayed it on our corn, um, but I recently did some cultural research on that and found that when you have giant ragweed also on your property, that it cuts down, it, that's another host for um, army worms and corn earworms. So when you have ragweed, then it's, you know, takes away from the corn earworms on the corn. Are you the if it's in the right area, I guess. <laughs> if you don't have allergies to it. <laughs> and the yield again difference. You, you mentioned that you use the chicken manure again for the yield. Mm -hmm. Was there an overall number for the yield, or was it just by? Um, the way I determine yield is by different varieties. So in general, all of the varieties have better yields with the um, chicken manure use, but there were a few that did better with the triple 20. Um, again, I think that would be interesting if I had done something with like scientific analysis or like, you know, crushed up the plants and gone into a lab and worked with what's the biochemical properties now at this plant between um, the chicken manure use or the triple 20 use. I did do soil tests at the beginning and the end of each plot and um, the the organic plots definitely had better soil organic matter in them at the end of it. So is your dad using chicken manure now or, or just you? My dad's not actually a full-time farmer. He is a Microsoft engineer and he's self-employed, uh, but he has had a garden his whole life and he helped his parents. Um, so he helps us within the family farm. So sort of since he's at work all day and now I have this degree and I've expanded my part in it a lot. I sort of make a managerial decision and then consult him on it because he has so much knowledge and then make sure no one else in the family has an objection and then say, this is what we're going to do. How about a nice round of applause?